Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Books are portable magic. Hello, welcome to Sundoku, a podcast especially for anyone who just likes talking about books of all kinds. I'm Annie Hastwell. And I'm Kath Keneally. Kath, a few big stories around books and reading at the moment, aren't there? Like the book bans in the US. Yes, it's spine chilling. And uh, not just books, but Disney movies that uh, have characters who aren't binary straight down the line in certain people's judgment. Mm, And it's like a slippery slope because I read somewhere there are complaints about books portraying amputees, sexy seahorses, gay penguins or children's biographies of black Americans. So it's like if I don't like it, I don't want anyone to write about it, seems to be the the message. Mm. Not good. And the other one, of course, which has been around for a while but I think is still being talked about is this idea of rewriting books so that you take out words like ugly or fat or anything that can be construed these days to be a complete insult. Mm. Well, Roald Dahl would have to be thrown hook, like hind sinker in the incinerator because... Well, he, he's the one that's the most in the firing line there, I think. And if you take all of that out, there's not much left. I and, know. Uh, and kids are good at understanding that these things are not appropriate for them to do uh, but to get a naughty thrill out of naughty adults Mm, and also I think a sense of how things were in the times is really important yeah Yeah. otherwise we live in a perpetual present tense where everything's sanitized that old uh, chestnut about rewriting Enid Blyton Mm. and she was off the shelves for decades she's on again and apart from that Annie how is your reading progressing I'm exhausted with reading at the moment, but I'm loving every single thing I'm reading. That's why. It's pretty eclectic. The pile keeps growing. I read this book called The Anniversary. I'm going to chase down Stephanie Bishop for an interview, actually, which Mm -hmm. is a fascinating kind of um, psychological pulling apart of a relationship with a big thriller content as well because it involves a death overboard on a boat. Very Mm. interesting book indeed. Mm. Where One of those books where you see... Go back into the past and it's not quite, when you start examining it, you realise it's not quite as you had remembered it. So it's about the stories we tell ourselves about our lives Mm -hmm. and what happens when you interrogate those. I've also been reading a book that everybody else read years ago called Pachinko, which I absolutely love, set in Japanese-occupied Korea. And then another book called The Sun Walks Down and I have talked to the author of that. I've read it and talked to her just yesterday. So we'll be running that on a program coming up soon. Uh, the Sun Walks Down, set in the Northern Flinders. Fascinating book, really mm. fascinating book. It's, I don't even want to say too much about it yet, but I just loved it. Well done. I'll add those to my pile, <laughs> if they'll stand it. Yes, what's on your pile? Well, I've just finished reading two Chris Hammer books in a row. He's a journalist who writes um, thrillers, I guess you could say. They're tremendously well-researched. They're very well written and he has been everywhere and reported on everything so his settings are always spectacularly good treasure and dirt is set in finnegan's gap which is supposed to be near lightning ridge i don't think it exists maybe it does but it's about opal mining that's carries a lot of uh, weight and tilt his most recent one i read on the advice of my sister and that is spectacularly good too. All I can do is recommend it and I am also going to chase down Chris Hammer and see if we can get hold of him for this program. And before that, I read Summer Water by English author Sarah Moss uh, about, uh, I think it's eight families who fetch up in a very cold summer break on the shores of a lock in the Scottish Highlands and what uh, goes down Mm. during the course of that holiday. I just think she's a spectacularly good writer. Okay, and on today's program, in just a moment, I'll be taking you to the bar at the hotel where Adelaide Writers' Week guests were put up this year. It was early in the morning. We thought it would be nice and quiet, but patrons started 
filtering in fairly quickly. Having clinky breakfast. So there's some interesting background noise. Uh, Oh, and that's where I met Irish chef turned author Louise Kennedy, who is one of the stars of this program. And later on, we will talk to an American writer who's been taking a look at what people were reading when Captain Cook was hero of the day. And it turns out that he really wasn't so much of a hero. There was a lot of cynicism and satire around those scientific expeditions. First, let's meet Louise Kennedy, who really is the hero of the hour. She's um, a late arriving author, having spent most of uh, her career as a successful chef until she wasn't and things went downhill. And she explained to me how she was shamed into taking up writing. I didn't plan to write. I could very easily never have written. And when I joined a writing group, at the very first meeting, it was agreed that we would each try to write a short story, a 2,000-word short story, and we were going to take it in turn. So I had five weeks to come up with this thing. And um, I was very tempted not to go back. But I thought at least I could just give it a lash and they'd probably tell me it was terrible and I wouldn't have to do it again. But I wouldn't have shamed myself either. So I think when I got home that night, I started to try and write. And um, so I think that um, maybe the short story is like the natural unit of fiction, you know, for workshops and MA programmes and that sort of thing. The following year, I enrolled in an MA creative writing in Queen's University in Belfast and um, that did a few things I suppose it gave me deadlines and it gave me I guess a kind of a peer group but maybe most importantly it brought me back to the north of Ireland because I hadn't lived there since I was 12. I suppose that also brought me because it brought me back to the north that maybe it started making me think about things and remember the way the things were when I was a child so I guess that maybe that kind of led me to to writing Trespasses but with regard to the short stories yeah um, I think because I was just expected to write short stories, that's what I was doing. But something had begun to happen. Um, The final story in in The End of the World is a cul-de-sac, Garland Sunday, gave me terrible trouble. And it's the longest story in in the collection. It took me maybe 13 months on and off to write that. And I think I wrote over 60,000 words. Now, not a linear 60,000 words, but I had to try so many different ways in because there are a couple of different story threads you know there, there are two women I suppose across generations um, but we have similar kind of on uh, I, I don't know I suppose um, similar difficulties but at different times in Ireland I think that when I then started to actually write Trespasses which I knew from the outset was going to be a novel I realised that the problem with Garland Sunday was that I was trying to stuff a novel into a short story form the ideas had started to become too big for the short story form. That I, sometimes a short story is just like a moment. That's you know this kind of moment of revelation or something. But I think my stories were starting to get a lot more complex with the temporal frame and also with maybe characters and things like that. So with trespasses, you set it within a frame. It's 1975 for the most part, but we open the book and it's 2015 and there's the unveiling of a statue going on and so we know well those of us who are dreading what might be about to happen in the story who know anything about 1975 and and Belfast and and Northern Ireland at the time at least you let us know that the main character survives was that your idea it was funny because I didn't really entirely know what I was doing that very first part the um, the prologue that was the first thing that I ever wrote that, that ended up in the novel but I didn't think I was writing a novel so during my MA year in Queen's um, we did a, a life writing module every every week the, the tutor would um, give us an exercise we say like write 800 words on whatever so one week he told us to go next door into the Ulster Museum and pick an exhibit or a piece of art and write about it and I went in there and it, it was at the tail end of an exhibition called The Art of the Troubles and I suppose it made me think about what art could do that language can't do in a place where, where words are very, they're just very fraught. So even if you think about, you know, the Good Friday Agreement, what most people call the Good Friday Agreement, but not everybody calls it that. Some people call it the Belfast Agreement. Even in naming the place, that that's problematic. Some people call it Northern Ireland, some people call it the North of Ireland and both of those can suggest a political position so there's just, there's really very little that you can say about the place that isn't difficult around language so yeah I think I possibly imagined you know a ghost of the troubles in this kind of sculptural form or something and um, and then imagined a life form 
But when I, when I say imagined a life for him, I think that Kushla that ended up being a lot more compelling for me to write, you know, this young female character than, than you know, this older man. So Kushla is, it's all very much close to kind of Kushla's heart and from her point of view. It's an absolutely genius opening scene, I thought, when we move into the, the heart of the book, because here's Kushla late for her shift in her brother's bar. Nominally, it's her mother, Gina's bar, but Gina's a bit unreliable. And she's frantically trying to rub the Ash Wednesday ashes off her forehead because this is a brand. She shouldn't be flaunting, or she feels she shouldn't be flaunting. And so one of the the regulars in the bar actually gives her a good tip on on how to do that with a little bit of life boy sofa and a towel. But I thought that was just a beautiful way in. And we do meet all of the regulars in the bar who we keep coming back to. Do you want to just set that scene for us? Tell us who they are. Yes, so the bar is, um, I suppose it maybe the bar reflects the demographic of the town generally. Um, so the Kushner's family are Catholic. They own a bar in a, in a wee town that's about 90% Protestant. And um, the clientele probably reflects that demographic. So there are British soldiers who come in. There's a very large barracks. They come in when they're off duty. I suppose um, every pub, you know, um, would have a set of characters. And um, I suppose this is the thing that later on when I ran bars myself, Regulars in a bar, it's like, you know when you go into like to work, it's, it's actually like walking into someone else's living room except that you're paying all the bills and they tend to have very strong opinions about the volume on the television and whether the central heating should be on and all that kind of thing. Yeah, so when, when Kushla gets into work, she's frantically trying to rub off her ashes that she got on Ash Wednesday. And also, because the, the local parish priest is a lunatic, the, um, the cross is enormous on her head, so that's a bit of work. So at the bar, there is, there's an old kind of single Catholic man who's probably a bit of a, a, you know, a drink problem. And he has an egg in his breast pocket because he buys an egg and a, and a, and a, a rasher for his tea every night. There's a guy who lives with his mother uh, who has a sweet shop, but he's also um, a brigadier of the local branch of the UDA, the Ulster Defence Association. And uh, there's a man who can't speak until he's drunk called Leslie. And then there's a school t- caretaker called uh, Minty who... Um, who um, has drink so much Carlsberg special brew that the pub won an award for having the highest sales in Northern Ireland, but he's the only person who drinks it. So there's a little trophy behind the bar. So um, yeah, there's, there's all of that, yeah. And then the title itself makes us wonder what constitutes a trespass in the Troubles. It's trespasses, not trespassers. And maybe in those days, you don't know until you cross a line, or maybe you know very well. I think that Kush is maybe a mixture of uh, naive, in a way. I mean, she is pretty naive. She, she's 24, but she lives with her mum. I mean, she has had a relationship before, but it was a kind of um, a very functional kind of brief thing um, when, when she was a student. So I guess she's living with her mum, who's recently widowed. They're all kind of still a bit griefy. Um, when she goes to work in the bar, I mean, there's a fairly, they're a fairly rum lot, really. Like, there's none of those men, you know, would be turning your head at all. And um, and also maybe because of the way that Belfast or the North was then. My parents, you know, met and married in the 60s, and they talk a lot about, you know, the great crack they had in dance halls and bars and everything. But by the time the 70s came, they were all gone because the um, city centre was like a no-go area. It closed at about 5.30. There were no bars, no dances. So there really weren't opportunities for, for people to, to meet anyone. So I suppose that when, when, you know, this older man walks into a bar, I mean, he looks a bit of a cut above the rest. Her head is probably turned, but I think she probably knows fairly well that she's not supposed to be going there. The other wonderful microcosm in the book, and it, it's, it's another simple idea, but it works brilliantly, is the school where Kushler teaches. This is her, her day job. Is it St. Dallin's? St. Dallin, yeah. Dallin is a county saint. Yeah, uh, yeah Dallin. Yeah, no, it, he'd be a fairly local kind of a saint to, to that part of the north, yeah, St. Dallin. <laughs> Who are the big noises in that school? There's the school principal, um, who's called Mr Bradley, and he is, I think he's probably a snob. He is probably very much in the clutches, clutches of the kind of sinister parish priest who lives in the parochial house in the grounds next to the school and who appears every once in a while and terrorises the children with terrible stories of sectarian violence um, just to remind them that, 
you know, they need to stick to their own kind. And so that's um, who runs the school. And I suppose that what happens maybe a little bit later is that Kushla becomes very close to a wee boy in her class. And um, I think there is, he's a child called Davy McGill. There's probably a Davy in every class. Um, and um, Davy's a bit lost and a little bit spacey and the other kids aren't very nice to him. And then something happens in his family and Kushla feels kind of moved to help them. But that starts to really upset the kind of social order as far as the priest and the and the school principal are concerned. Davy McGowan is just the most fabulous little character. And uh, he's born into a situation that you probably should explain. He's got the spirit for anything. He's just a darling little boy. You can't keep him down. He's a clown. He's a performer. Tell us about his home life and why it's problematic. So um, again, I guess this goes back to um, the demographic of the town and just about sort of society and the divisions in society in general in the north. So um, Davy's father is Catholic. His mother is Protestant. And uh, the Catholic Church expected that um, that uh, the, the, the kind of not, the, that the spouse, you know, would convert. But um, Davy's mother Betty has resisted. She hasn't converted. Now she's gone along with it to some extent because her children are being raised as Catholic, but they're working class because Davy's father struggles to get employment. Um, and they live in um, a big loyalist, kind of Protestant loyalist estate where they're really quite out on a limb because Davy's father's a Catholic, which is, you know, not ideal. But also Betty is really seen as a kind of traitor because she has married a Catholic. Davy's older brother and Davy and his sister get a hard time from the kids on the estate and on the street and um, it probably particularly affects the older brother because he's a teenager so he has to you know he's wearing the wrong uniform and stuff and has to run the gauntlet of um, of you know kind of groups of, of lads hanging around the place um, so yeah I think that that's maybe you know that, that Davy's family kind of reflects the taboos around mixing mixed marriages and stuff and this is um, what builds up into the disaster at, at, at the end of the novel, which we won't go to. But I do want to say how much I love the love story between Kushla and Michael Agnew. It's, it's just beautiful and that could have been a novel on its own. Her falling, it's her first head over heels, desperately in love love affair and Michael although he has the greater experience and he has status and authority he's pretty badly hit as well it could have been a novel all by itself but it can't be in this time I think not and then maybe I just um, I mean I think even when like my sisters and stuff would say that when I'm speaking I get kind of easily distracted and start going down rabbit holes so I think there's maybe that sort of thing going on in my head all the time so I I did think I was writing a love story but very quickly then I thought I think Davy the wee, the wee boy came to me quite quickly once I decided that Kushla was um, a teacher because I, I didn't want to just have her going in and out of school you know I, I don't know and then very quickly it just all seemed to get quite complicated and twisted together in some way but I, I, that maybe came out in the writing of it I didn't plan to have like any kind of twists and connections it just sort of came out as I went along well and it does come out and you you do some absolutely beautiful set pieces where you show how this is probably not going to work and one of the lovely ones is Michael's idea for introducing Kushler into his social scene it's going to be very hard for them to see each other. So what Michael um, figures out, he comes into the pub one night and she's kind of aware of him and she maybe thinks he's aware of her. And then she goes to the theatre one night with her friend Jerry and and they bump into Michael. And he's not with his wife, he's with a, a pair of friends of his. And they chat for a couple of minutes and he realises that she speaks Irish. So he goes, oh, well, my friends and I are learning Irish. So, in fairness to Michael, he does his homework. The others are really only playing at it. Um, you know, they're kind of messing, but he does actually, you know, do his homework and everything else. But I guess it is a ruse just to, um, to get to see her. And um, that brings Kushla out of her, you know, kind of very quiet life with her mother um, into mixing with these people who are really very different from her. I guess they're kind of like the, um, the Belfast 1975 equivalent of, you know, bourgeois bohemians or something. They are, they are. That was so beautiful. And all you had to do to point out the differences and how it was never going to work was describe the meal that Penny is cooking for Michael and Kushler. Yeah. And 
and her surroundings. Can you do that from memory? Yeah, so I suppose um, Kushla goes into this house and it's this lovely big sort of red brick house, red brick house in its own grounds, you know, with a couple of stone pillars, but a little bit scruffy in the way that, you know, rich people have the confidence to be a bit scruffy, whereas people maybe who aren't used to it are probably still trying to keep up appearances. So, you know, the, the driveway's maybe a bit fuzzy with moss and then they get inside and the place is a little bit battered, but there's like original art on the walls because Penny's an artist and, um, you know, he's a historian, so they're like literary journals stuffed around the place. And um, and then in the kitchen, it's still the old kind of Victorian kitchen. And in my head, Kush's parents live in a house a little bit like that, only a lot smaller. But her mother has ripped it out and stuck a Formica kitchen in instead. Whereas, you know, Penny would have had the confidence to keep the old one. So, the you know, there are kind of jelly moulds hanging on the walls and Victorian jelly moulds and the, the cupboards are stuffed full of tins of food that they've bought um, on, you know, holidays in France, driving holidays in France and that sort of thing. And it's really very different from the way that Kushla's mother would approach um, and she doesn't even entertain. I don't know what she does, but, you know, she's certainly not like having dinner parties and things. Yeah. And that does spark. I mean, Kushla's no, she's not completely naive about all of this. She's, she's, pretty peeved about being exoticised mm-hmm. as the Irish speaking Absolutely. native and yeah. the token tag yeah. and yeah. Uh, but she can't stay away from him she just can't stay away so um, yeah it was funny I thought then maybe are people going to get that but I think a lot of a lot of people who maybe can remember being very kind of in awe of someone you know when they're younger can remember like looking back and thinking what was I doing you know sitting there being patronised by these awful people but that's kind of what it is I mean they do kind of talk down to her and sometimes there's a wee bit of a sectarian edge to some of the banter that she finds difficult and Michael doesn't quite understand it he thinks he does but he doesn't really although we never lose our sympathy for Michael he's a he's a good guy He's a good guy. At the same time, I mean, I think that he's a good guy in his professional life and he's quite charming and I think that he's probably good hearted, but he's also a philander in article. Yes, yes. That, which Kushla finds out much later. Um, I mean, she's probably convincing herself, you know, or, or, or wanting to believe that um, that he kind of can't help himself. But then, I mean, I guess it turns out that she's certainly not the first. So, yeah, but I mean, I guess people are complex. You know, there are people who can be kind of good in some aspects of their lives and, and a bit um, maybe morally suspect in other aspects, you know. We kind of know that, I don't think I'm giving anything away, that this is this love affair is not going to work out well. And actually the bad things happen only about two-thirds of the way through the novel, which gives Kushler time to process it a little bit, but also time for the other genuinely sectarian, terrible stuff to work up and, and um, crystallise at the end. So... Quite a lot happens in a short time. I think it does, but I, I mean, I, I know that so I've had lots of messages from people who I don't know, maybe direct messages on Twitter or people who just tag me in things and go, oh my God, I've just got to page 252, what are you trying to do to me? And I really thought that I had flagged these things all the way through. I thought that I did, but some people seem to be genuinely surprised. I don't know, I, I guess that maybe, I hope that it would reflect the way life is, is that you think you're going along and everything's all right and you're keeping all the balls in the air and then something outrageous happens and you just have to try and deal with it and that sometimes that can trigger other things or reveal other things so I don't know I, I think I just kind of wrote and then I got to that point where this thing had to happen and then I don't, I don't know I didn't have a plan I just kept like trying just kind of wrote my way out of it yeah that was Irish author Louise Kennedy who was in Adelaide for Writers Week this year with her book Trespasses set in Belfast of 1975. Her other book to date is The End of the World is a Cul-de-Sac and that is a fabulous book of short stories. Now to Captain Cook and what was being written in his day. Going viral, being cancelled or media frenzy, they're not the ideas that we associate with the 18th century. But when Captain Cook was setting off on his various scientific voyages, the British public were gossiping and speculating like crazy. US academic Sa Sahar has delved into what was actually being written and circulated at the time, and he found that the scientific expeditions were the subject of a lot of satire and ridicule, and the main target in the public's eyes was scientist Joseph Banks. You know, he was kind of a a big celebrity as much as they had celebrities in the 18th century. And so a lot of the interest was really 
uh, about Joseph Banks getting back from the first voyage. And at the time, it was not Captain Cook, it was Lieutenant Cook. Nobody really cared much at all about Lieutenant Cook. But the first release of the voyages didn't actually occur until 1773. And by release, I mean the uh, account of the voyages, which was, you know, the, the official accounts approved by the Royal Navy that communicated to the public what had happened on uh, Cook's circumnavigation of the world. And so a lot of the excitement had to be kind of waited, you know, two years in, until the actual publication of the voyage uh, was released. But in that time, excitement was already brewing because Joseph Banks was supposed to serve with Captain Cook on a second voyage. And some information had leaked in the newspapers because Joseph Banks had wanted to have very luxurious and spacious accommodations on the second voyage. And he had gone into an argument with the Royal Navy because he wanted the ship to be better outfitted for a scientific expedition, because that's what made the Cook voyages so different and such a turning point in the history of exploration, because these this was like the first time people were saying, you know, we're going on a voyage in the name of science and discovery, not in the name of, you know, some mercantile conquest, even though they were, you know, naming things part of the British Empire left and right. The kind of new PR move, if you will, is that this is a voyage of exploration and discovery of science. It was really important, I suppose, to bring the public along with the whole thing because it was incredibly expensive. So that's what writing about the voyages was all about. They were written in a way to, to pump them up to be so important that you wouldn't complain about the cost, for example. Yes, yes. It's written to pump the, the exactly as you say, to, to kind of entice audiences, to, to kind of entice their curiosity you know, in a very similar way that, you know, Americans today are concerned about the cost of going to Mars or whatever, or they were concerned in the, in the, in the sixties about the cost of going to the moon during that time, those debates kind of have their parallels in, in which, what is the purpose of exploration, uh, as opposed to, you know, colonialization, as opposed to, you know, expanding the British empire. And so Joseph Banks, him making all these altercations to the ship to turn the ship of the second voyage into a vessel of science. But when press reports leak out of it, they're talking about him going, quote, unquote, with all the splendor of an Eastern monarch, right? Like he's concerned about having velvet floors or whatever in the cabins. And, and they're right about this. He didn't just want rooms also for his scientists. He also wanted rooms, you know, for his servants. And so it's like a both a scientific expedition, but like a luxury cruise outfitted for, you know, this extremely wealthy aristocrat who was constantly in the newspapers because he was always sleeping around with women. He'd be seen in public with courtesans, prostitutes. And so he's this very kind of attractive figure to the public. When they tried to sail with Banks's modifications to the ship, it was too top heavy. And the uh, captain of the ship said, you know, I would not sail in this ship. You know, this ship is, is, is not fit for sea. It's too top heavy with all these modifications that Joseph Banks has put onto it. So this is, of course, just pure gold for anybody working in journalism because it <laughs> it's just captures such a kind of comical situation of, you know, there's a scientific expedition for, for the good of the British Empire. And doing the rounds in the popular press at the time was a 16-page satirical publication by John Scott. It was a send-up piece in the form of an ode to Joseph Banks from a Polynesian queen. Obera was a Tahitian chiefess, and so Queen Obera became this hugely famous personage in you know the English public, both visually because you know there's illustrations of you know the way she dressed, you know kind of flowers in the hair, the whole Tahitian look which just like spread like wildfire throughout, you know, British society, you know, women imitating the way Obera dressed. There's another thing, actually, Obera was famous because she was polygamous, because she has all these different lovers that, you know, it's just so unusual, uh, you know, from the British perspective. Now, if you look into a lot of the uh, texts, primary texts from the voyage, it, it's probably likely that 
Banks did not sleep with Obera, but he was sleeping with some other Polynesian women. That wasn't really important. What was really important to the media at the time was this idea that Banks is like this guy who's like 25 or something, and Obera is kind of like an aging beauty type of figure. She's like maybe 40 or something, and, and it's this to them it's this comical relationship where she's kind of romantically kind of pursuing him and her romantic pursuits are are kind of parodied in the poem because they have like um a part in the voyages where like obera introduces all the crew to like a dinner and and one of the things they eat is dog in the satirical poem that they write about you know obera and banks you know she's kind of wooing him with like a feast of dog and and she's actually she's modeled on calypso from ovid's calypso's island where you know odysseus comes to this island where, you know, time stops and Calypso's kind of the, the queen of the island and she's kind of like Obera, kind of like in her 40s or something. The official account of Cook's voyages by John Hawksworth was equally entertaining for the public but tragic for him. John Hawksworth takes Cook's diaries and Banks's diaries and he's tasked with making a um, basically a really fun text out of it and so he changes it. And there's this whole scandal after he changes it that basically gets him like the 18th century equivalent of canceled, like uh, because he puts so many kind of frank depictions of sex in there and, you know, questions, you know, the, the fact that, you know, God exists. And uh, he actually commits suicide by an opium overdose because the blowback is just so you know, he can't deal with the, with the blowback just a few months after the, the release of the voyages. Where does that blowback come from? Does the it... blowback comes from a huge part of the British press that, you know, thinks this is going to have a corrupting influence on, especially on women who are kind of upper class women who are kind of may look up to Obera and, um, and, and see this idea of like a, a polygamous, you know, Tahitian chiefess as, uh, you know, something to strive to. Mm. Um, that's that's one aspect. There's a lot of other aspects as well. He's kind of taking almost kind of a, a an approach of moral relativism, like saying, "Look at these people; they they exist according to you know the customs of their culture, and 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 there's no kind of culture that's you know better or worse than another." He doesn't say that explicitly, but those kinds of like implications are what make people kind of revile him and, and included in these people are, are one of his biggest benefactors is Samuel Johnson who's a hugely famous critic it's the mainstream press but it's also kind of a literary establishment so he got cancelled um, that's such a modern concept isn't it but you can imagine how it happened then and one of the other things that was happening then yeah. was was John Scott and the satirical poem that did the rounds with the public and that was a bit like something going viral wasn't it yeah, it is. It's like viral in the sense of like, you know, on Twitter, somebody like might might riff off of another tweet and then somebody riffs off of another tweet. And that's kind of the way that functions. Like he's riffing off of the uh, John Scott's riffing off of the, um, the account of the voyages by Hawksworth. You know, it's parroting that. But then he starts the Obera cycle, but then other poets and other people, you know, the Obera cycle gets bigger and bigger and snowballs. And the other people are kind of also doing their own versions now. Were you surprised when you when you and, went into all these sources to find that how lively the discussion was around what they were doing and how worthy it was? Yeah, I was surprised, and I was surprised at how salacious it was, especially with you know the sex tourism aspect. But you know the press was just you know having a field day with all these sexual uh, conquests of banks. Uh, the other thing that kind of comes up is when you research Captain Cook's death is that. At the time when Captain Cook was murdered in 1779, February 14th, Valentine's Day, actually, in Hawaii, he's actually kind of a fading figure and nobody really cares about him anymore. What's happening in the news at at Britain at that time is that there's the war in the American colonies. And here's Captain Cook going on, you know, on his third voyage. But of course, this third voyage becomes famous again because Captain Cook is murdered for mysterious reasons on the beach of Hawaii. During his murder, the way his murder is depicted by the artist that traveled with him, John Weber, they have this line underneath the the print that accompanies the the official voyages, which is something like, um, 
murdered by the heathens uh, he sought to save or something like that. The humanitarian cook murdered because of his own humanity. And it's, it's the illustration shows um, Hawaiians about to stab him in the back while he's motioning at his, the rest of his crew to stop shooting at the Hawaiians. And the reason an illustration like that was necessary because it wasn't at all clear that he was a humanitarian figure. And so it's, it's, it's kind of the necessary PR campaign on the part of the Royal Navy to mm. solidify Captain Cook's reputation in that manner, especially when you consider a lot of, you know, there's all these poems coming out or, you know, there's a lot of debates and disputes in the press on, on the status of Captain Cook, on the status of what the British were doing to the Polynesians, but also the greater, you know, because Captain Cook went all around the world, although, although the most media saturated place that he went ended up being Polynesia. That's Sa Saha. He's a US literary academic and he was talking about the research he's done into the writings around Captain Cook's voyages. This is Sundoku, the perfect podcast for anyone who's planning on spending the dreary winter months with a pile of books reading by a fire. <laughs> My name is Emma. So at the moment I am reading Never by Ken Follett, which is um, got the tagline, the path to war begins with one full step. Uh, it's a big doorstop of a book. And like the other Ken Follett's that I've read, he, he has a few different distinct storylines all going at once and I'm expecting them all to be brought together. So it's about uh, international relations, essentially, which is one of something that I like reading about. And I like international relations and spy books. What's sitting in my Sundoku? Probably over a hundred books, I reckon. I'm renowned for going into a, a second-hand shop and going straight to the book section. And when they're at 50 cents or two dollars each, it's hard to walk past some. But I've had to actually put a moratorium on it and not buy any more because. Along with all the ones that I bought in the last few years, I have also got boxes of books that I still haven't unpacked after moving. One of the best books I've read that still captures me now, I think I must have read it almost 20 years ago, is The Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver. This book really brought together two really distinct cultures of Baptist Americans going to the deepest, darkest parts of Africa at the time and clashing with the local culture, but also trying to integrate into it. And the way she wrote it through the different perspectives and in the different voices of all of the children in the family, I just thought was this beautiful piece of writing. And I lent my copy of it to someone, I don't know where it's gone, so I'm gonna have to go back to those op shops and find a copy of it to, to buy. And we'd love to hear from you if you're keen to share your reading habits and your reading past. And give us a glimpse of your Sundoku. Send us a voice memo to sundokucast at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Kath Keneally. And I'm Annie Hastwell. Catch you next time. This podcast is produced by four book addicts refusing treatment. Sarah Martin. Annie Hastwell. Michaela Andreev and me, Kath Keneally. Our thanks to composer Quincy Grant for the music. If you want to find out more about the books and authors featured in this program, check out the show notes. And you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at SundokuCast, which is T-S-U-N-D-O-K-U, Cast. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. <laughs>